This is an interview with Leon Lee, the founder of Only One. Leon and I had a extremely wide ranging conversation. We talked about Only One, we talked about his background. We also covered governance models, potential future governance models, the influence of consciousness, the connection to the entire universe. It was everything bundled in one podcast. Uh, one of the most wide ranging and fun conversations I've had in a long, long time. So I hope you really enjoy this one. Here is Leon Lee, founder of Only One. Well, just like that, we're live. Uh, this is a uh, podcast I can already feel is off to a, a good start. We had a great pre-show, one of my favorites, hmm. and uh, now we're rolling. So Leon, who I mentioned pre-show, my son's name is Leo, so I already already had a good feeling before coming in. Uh, you started this project called Only One, and previous to that, previous to crypto, you were in, studying biology and had your previous startup in... Uh, well, I'd love for you to just describe what your previous company did first, and then we can kind of segue into Only One. Sure. Sounds good. Uh, so first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me to the show. Really pleasure to be here. And also, I enjoyed the uh, pre-recording conversations just now. I'm sure we'll get back to those conversations later. Um, my name is Leon, uh, founder of Only One. Uh, quick background about myself. I'm, I'm actually the uh, wrong type of engineer for this industry. I'm a genetic engineer. And um, my first startup was in biotech. We made milk without cows by um, basically transforming yeast with uh, cow's DNA that produces milk, and then we would ferment that yeast like you would ferment beer and then create milk protein, and that's the organic part of milk, which theoretically means we can create milk without cows. And that costs it seven or 8,000 USD per glass, which, and, and it would probably kill you because there's a lot of uh, um, substances in there that is fatal for humans. But anyway, that was the first startup experience that I've had, and around 2017, I was involved by uh, in crypto for investing into a few ICOs. Um, I don't know if maybe part of the audience was around already since back in the old days. And um, there wasn't a lot of DEXs back then. So a lot of those ICOs kind of became total loss because they never got listed on the centralized exchange and there's no swaps. So that's kind of how I got started and uh, basically kind of got wrecked. But then it really... I guess, educated myself and enlightened me about the potentials of the blockchain technology, which is um, something that I feel is really going to change the world. But if you look into a lot of those white papers back then, you would realize a lot of them actually don't need blockchain to exist. Like, for example, if you're making a, I don't know, like a, like a burger delivery app, then there really isn't, or at least not a clear um, reason why they would need blockchain, but it was just easier to raise funding back then. Um, so fast forward, uh, always wanted to build something in this space and uh, been in like different mobile app startups as like product team since then in Hong Kong. Then in 2021, last year, we've all noticed the boom of the NFTs. And uh, back in those days, I think it was just CryptoKitties, Punk just got started and uh, Board Ape wasn't as big of a hype back then. And NFTs kind of existed as, as a pure form of sort of digital uh, collectibles and we looked into it like how the sales volume went up by thousands of percent like every month and we thought okay like there's no way nft uh is just gonna be jpegs there's got to be more features to it as a unique digital identifier so uh back then we thought okay nft really needs to be utility driven uh, which of course nowadays is kind of a consensus amongst people that have investing in uh, nfts uh, and we've seen obviously adoption of NFT in game space, right? Like Axis Infinity and Sandbox and Metaverses and all that, which makes a lot of sense to me because uh, players do care a lot about in-game item ownership. And another vertical that we looked into was social space, right? Um, social space has always been inseparable from community, content creation, creator economy, and stuff like that, which is... Um, what NFTs all, always been about. So that's like uh, how we got started looking into how NFTs can disrupt the um, uh, social cr uh, creator economy uh, industry. So um, yeah, that's how we got started. And in a very short sentence to describe only one, only one helps creator monetize uh, their activities and content on the internet without having to rely on third parties through the help of NFTs. 
Hmm. And the, the primary use case to kick it off would be digital artists, like uh, people making not, not, not just limited to JPEGs, but online art. Yeah, um, I think uh, we, that's a good question because when people use the word creator, it, we tend to use it very interchangeably between like a web free project selling an NFT as a product or a content creator that has an audience where they produce content for, such as yourself, you're a creator of a podcast, of a YouTube channel. And on the other hand, uh, for example, OK Bear is also a creator. But there, I think there's a, quite a systematic difference between the two types. One of them is a company creating a product and creating a community out of that product. Whereas for content creators, it's really about uh, their existing audience. How do you serve them better? How do you connect with your audience better? So we're really talking about the latter a lot more. So for content creators, the main problem, as maybe you would agree, and you can tell me more about this if you if you want, um, it's it's not easy to monetize your content in the web two world, right? Like if you're on YouTube, you have to get into their partnership program. If you're on Instagram, they obviously don't pay you directly. Right. And there's this cheesy saying that, you know, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. So our engagement on Instagram or most other social channels uh, generally produce a lot of value by simply being engaging and that creates a lot of attention. So everyone that's listening probably use at least two or three different types of social media. But we never get paid for it, and we have no control over the uh, data that is being recorded. And uh, for the content creators, they have to monetize through other means, such as selling merchandise, drop shipping, affiliate links, sponsorships, all of that, or even have to resort to, you know, uh, basically asking for donations through Patreon or, you know, tips and stuff like that. So um, I think what NFTs and blockchain allows or like opens the doors for creators is uh, there's a decentralized way to be able to capture this value and then giving it back to the creators directly. Mm, interesting. And the decentralized way to capture value and give it back to creators would be through the tokens, through allowing the listeners or consumers of the content, say in the case of the content, the community builders, uh, mm -hmm. take this podcast, for example, people listening now, what what would be the mechanics you think like the bread and butter simplest use case for say podcast listeners they're listening is there a do you view the token as a method or a mechanism for donation or <clears throat> or other value for the consumers on the token specifically or other parts of the web3 opportunity hmm. i think um that i wouldn't put token as the centerpiece of the conversation just because i think on a conceptual level uh it's it's more important maybe i would answer that question by with a question first uh how would you define social fi which is obviously a new buzzword that people are throwing around oh i probably don't have a good answer to it uh to be honest i haven't i've, I've seen it but i don't really know what it's referring to social financial tools i mean is that social fi yeah, uh, generally speaking, like when people talk about GameFi, SocialFi, mm -hmm. it revolves around um, me mechanics that pay those that are participating in the network. And for games, it's very easy to understand. You play and earn, right? That's kind of been the uh, paradigm for the entire 2021, right? Like if, if you just look at the uh, sort of value appreciation of certain projects, then uh, people really enjoy that idea. Um, SocialFi is the same. So it's basically about how do you create a decentralized system where those that are participating in the social network gets paid according to how much value they're contributing to the network. And it goes, it almost goes both ways. Um, it's not just the content creator that is producing all the value of the network, because as you know, um, there needs to be an audience in order for there to be engagement, right? And so I think generally speaking, SocialFi, um, and this is, I think, one concept that most people are not seeing the full picture of. Um, it's about the platform being able to first capture those value and then through a smart contract, distribute it via a token back to those that are in the network, right? Like a lot of these projects, um, if we want to go back a few years, there's this platform called Steemit. Right. Steemit is a project that is like a decentralized medium, uh, mm -hmm. a place where people can write articles, write blogs, and 
if your blog or article receives a lot of attention and uh, you know likes and, and comments and stuff like that, the platform rewards you with Steemit tokens. And that really worked well during the bull market because there's always new capital coming in. Now, what those projects uh, tried but perhaps have failed to do is to capture the value generated in the first place. So if you look at the system, right, kind of this is the project. There's inflow of uh, capital and then there's outflow. So there's always good amount of outflow because they're rewarding creators, right? You're giving out tokens, but there's really no inflow, which creates this um, really hyperinflationary tokenomics. And I think that's not a sustainable uh, model in the long run. And most projects, I think, should start to look into monetization a little bit more. So anyway, I, I think I'm going a bit mm. too far with this, but generally, Socialfy is where a project's able to monetize the engagement and the activities of the social media users and then giving it back to those creators. Do you, do you see one of the, I've heard, uh, I've interviewed a few people who have, who are building significant crypto projects for gaming. And one of the things that a, cu a couple of them have said, I've noticed as patterns, is they're pretty skeptical of this uh, play to earn mentality in that people are playing a game to earn money and you can do it technically. I mean, we've clearly built the technology to enable that, but it kind of uh, defeats the purpose of the game or defeats the, the underlying value proposition of the game, which is like, it should be fun. And that's why you should want to do it as opposed to like, Hey, this is a form of income so I can play this game. It's effectively like, it's like proof of work almost like uh, proof of work for humans. It's like you're doing this, and you're getting return, but it's kind of uh, it's, it's like a well that's going to dry up because it's not really there's not value added into the system per se. Do you feel like mm -hmm. social fi has that potential risk where people who are listening to content sh sh typically should be I would want to use the word should uh, get value out of the content in and of itself, and then to add a layer of compensation there creates an mm -hmm. incentive for people to just listen to the, whatever pays them the most and maybe they game it so they're not actually listening. They're just like playing the video and then doing whatever in the background. Mm -hmm. how, how do you see the sustainability of the that model? Um, that so play to earn. I, I would say I share the sentiment of your previous um, uh, uh, interviewee. Basically, games should be fun, right? I don't know. Do you play Diablo? I chance. love Diablo. I haven't played it in a while, you love but Diablo. I have played it, yeah. So in Diablo 3, I don't know if you were there during that time, but for a very short period, there was a real money auction house where players can get in-game items like legendary items or magical items, whatever. They can put that into the auction house and get real money for it. And in a way, I think that's like the earliest form of play to earn on a centralized network. And I thought that was a very good example because in order for play to earn to work, most players need to be playing it for fun. And then there's a small amount of player playing it to make money. Well, mm -hmm. as soon as you open up the, you know, real money economy inside a game, there's going to be people coming in just to make money. Um, but this system, I think, fails when the game itself is not fun. So personally, I would maybe opt for calling it play and earn instead of play mm -hmm. to earn, because that kind of implies you're playing just to earn money instead of you're actually having fun. And the second part of that would be, like you said, the is it sustainable, right? Um, when you're, when you have a game like Diablo three, it's sustainable because there's always an inflow of capital, and uh, the the um, the platform's charging subscription fee, right? Or I, I think a subscription or is a one time fee, and they actually may, are making money. And on the auction house, um, most users would actually play the game and buy the item because it's fun instead of buying an F NFT because it helps them make more money in the future. Uh, so one of the things that um, my investors and myself are looking into is like um, on a sort of grander scope of things, there are a fundamental design for these projects, which is step one, users buy an NFT. Step two, they pay tokens and they enjoy the platform and they would earn more tokens. Step three, they need to spend the other token. So it's usually a dual token system. And a good example of that would be Axis Infinity or Step N, where you have to buy a pair of shoe, you spend GST to earn more GST, and then 
there's a GMT for you to spend. And what that system creates is a hyperinflationary reward token, and then there is a the real token or the governance token, right? It's the exact same case with uh, Axie Infinity with the SLP AXS and the Axie's NFT. So I think uh, I'll be personally very excited to see how the space develops in the future and how people might realize, hey, maybe this dual system thing is not really gonna work out. Maybe there are new ways to create a token econ economy which actually will be sustainable and also maintain a fun environment for the actual app. Because Axie Infinity is not a bad game, right? Like it's a turn-based game and Step N is actually a running app which people actually use without monetary reward anyway, right? So mm. yeah, that's my thought on it. Do, do you think, uh, do you think, do you see it as the people who are playing the game, say you buy Diablo, you play, so you're paying an upfront cost regardless of who you are. And you have some people who are just playing and there no incentive, of, no part of their gameplay is, is driven to make money. They're just players. And then you have some percentage, say 10%, who are purchasers of the game. So they pay the upfront cost. And then they're looking at recouping that cost and then earning real money through something that they're doing in-game. Do you view the potential of GameFi is like the the ten percent who are doing something in game add value to the ninety percent? Like maybe they're doing low level work, like they're building some. Could they be like constructing infrastructure in this game that then is stuff that you wouldn't normally want to do as a player, but you want to you would benefit from if that was created by other people? Like I mean, I kind of think of this as like this is how the way the world works. You know, you have people who finance projects like parks and buildings and then there's people who get paid to build those things they're not doing they're not building a park for fun they're doing it as a contractor for construction to get paid but then people go to the park purely for fun and maybe the park has an admission fee that you you pay to go i i almost see a, a lot of my framing for this kind of conversations is modeled off of what we've learned in the real world and then how that fits into the landscape of the Web3 world? Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, it's almost like people are, a lot of people are seeing Web3 and Web2 as very separate type of worlds and with different uh, laws of physics or something like that, right? But in reality, I think what you said there is very true. Like um, for a, the, the, a game should not be designed in a way where you expect everyone to go there just to make money, right? It's almost like, I don't know if this is a directly good comparable, but imagine if every user, every user on a Bitcoin network are just miners, but no one's actually using it for transactions. Um, mm -hmm. Then you would just have the people that are mining, but there's no real usage to what they're doing with the network. So with a game, if everyone's just going there to make money, um, it's, I, I don't like to use this word, but it would seem almost like a Ponzi where the income of the people participating solely relies on the new capital coming in because right. more people want to come in to make money, right? But then the fundamental value of the game itself or the, any platform, sh I think, should really be the actual utility, right? Um, like a social platform should be people about uh, creating content, engaging, and tr maybe transacting with NFTs and connecting, making friends. For a game, it should be fun. People play it because in their spare time, they want to, you know, relax a little bit instead of an actual career. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I find these things fascinating because of how they seem to take over our our rational mind. You know, you can. It's amazing to me how you find this in all all parts of life where. I mean, it could be a literal Ponzi scheme in the public markets with like an investor who's taking money in, doubling down on their bets, showing the return for that, and then doing that over and over. And and get ca they get caught in that. And it's like this kind of addictive, se almost self-destructive mechanism where you, mm -hmm. you just kind of, you are in this delusional state where you're not taking into account first principles of how a system is constructed. And I feel that, that the, the massive spikes and crashes in the crypto world, both in NFT and in the assets, are are part of this like mental tripwire that humans fall into, which is like, this is gonna I'm super early. I gotta go big into this thing. This is good and then your your hopes and dreams of the returns start to kick in and then you get greedy and then it, it spikes up and then you're thinking everything's great. You double down. And then of course if there's not real value creation as fast as there is investment into the project, then things crash. And right now we're kind of in a depressionary period where 
the yeah. recalibration of value creation to investment is like equalizing. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated by how the, I think there's a lot of under investigation into this evolutionary process of, of psychology really, because the, how humans work is how web three will, will look, you know, if we're, if we're interested in games because of the way that humans are interested in games, well, the games, the best games will look that way. Like there's no coincidence why shooter games and multiplayer games are so popular. And it it feels a lot more like, um, a lot, the pathways to successful designing of systems can be a lot more sophisticated than they currently are. Yeah. And, I feel like what you're talking about there kind of resembles what Jack Dorsey has been talking about with his uh, Web5 thesis, right? Um, uh, for for some of the audience that perhaps haven't uh, read the article or something, um, so Web5 is what uh, this company called TBD and Jack Dorsey has been endorsing, which is essentially what it means is it's Web3 without the uh, financial incentives. So without the VCs, without utility tokens, with building a real decentralized network where people are participating in a decentralized way, not necessarily for um, monetary gains. And I think that concept, um, it's, I think it's, it's got pros and cons, right? You can try to shoot. I think we can all try to shoot holes in it. Like uh, there's always pros with VCs. There's always pros with, uh, you know, monetary incentive. But on the other side, uh, they're really like, into like open source development and all that. So yeah, so just to resonate with what you're saying there, um, I'm excited to see like the evolution of this industry going forward. Obviously right now we are in a depressionary state where the value is sort of correcting to its fundamentals. And during the bull market as a project, the Twitter space is very noisy. Like every day, every project, every new project is coming out and saying that they're going to change the world. And because how, you know, everything is gaining in value, people are kind of aping into all these new tokens, believing that everything's going to do a hundred X or whatever. But during a bear market, suddenly all these projects turn silent. And uh, it, if I don't know if you look at those like analytics on, on, on uh, Twitter and Solana, for some reason, even as like a newer project, we've been having a lot of uh, Twitter mentions. That's just saying how most projects are starting to like um, become quiet. So because of the sort of monetary um, gain and rather unjustified valuations, um, there's a lot of opportunists, a lot of people coming in to try to capture liquidity. And I think that's a big part of why crypto is very volatile and the crash we're seeing today are people kind of cashing out or becoming insolvent. Mm. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. I mean, it kind of, it makes sense from an evolutionary perspective. I was talking about this with my, my wife last night, actually, that there's a lot of corollaries between the way that human beings collectively, if you think of us as an organization, as, as a organism collectively, you have to, you have to try things and get feedback from the universe as to whether there's whether this is a endeavor worth continuing to pursue. It's like we have limitations on our existence, just like a, a plant would or a, a, a mushroom network would. And you, you, I mean, this this is the beauty of evolution: is that there's controlled experiments, and then there's there's cost you pay for those. So it's like we're gonna try this this way of coordinating on web three using this new type of technology and that either works or it doesn't. And the results are the results. I mean, that's, that is, that's the thing that we can rely on that brings objective truth to the world, which is like, this is either useful for people and people are paying and, and we have that measure. Like pricing is a, I think pricing is one of the most underrated uh, it, inventions of of human beings using technology. The fact that we all mm-hmm. agree on what the price of these assets are, and we can look at them. There's discrepancies there, right? But they're relatively minor. I mean, you're talking about like market pricing between bid and ask, which is separate than saying the the price of these things are within some degree of certainty. So I, I was mm-hmm. I was talking about it in the context of. Uh, what, how do you, can you draw a pattern yet? Can you see, you know, can you see the forest through the trees on 
the mm. directionality of us collectively. And I, I mean, th- this is where you start to, you start to arrive at conclusions that look more like the matrix simulation type of things where mm-hmm. it's like, okay, Facebook just made a major pivot. I mean, one of the largest companies in the world just said, we're going to spend all of our primary attention resources on building a virtual reality. I mean, that is like the, the degree, the impact of that still, I think, hasn't fully sunk in for people because they're, you know, they're on version two. It's like iPhone two kind of sucked. Like, but the, the, I, the promise of it was big, but it wasn't until like iPhone five where you're like, this is really useful for my life. So I, I think we're on like iPhone two of the virtual reality experience. So people are debating like, oh, it's not going to be that big of a deal. But if you and I threw on these little glasses, and I've said this before, but we threw on these little glasses and you, and we were, it's indistinguishable from real life. I mean, the implications of that are insane. I mean, that's like a, mm-hmm. that's like a explosion of creative potential at that point. <laughs> That yeah, to me, that's like, the, that's, that's what gets me super excited. Yeah. So all these innovations, and I think it's interesting that you brought up some biology and oneness and connectedness, like us humans are still animals. And I think there's a lot of similarities between evolution and the course of evolution in innovations. Like for example, um, for in, in, in animals, like in the desert, uh, sorry, in uh, Africa, like the trees, that are eaten a lot by the giraffes, they tend to die off. But then some trees by total random chance, and you can call these like maybe nature's experiments, they mutated a little bit where they grow a little bit higher. And now the giraffes cannot reach those trees. So these trees survive and then they pass on their genetics and that becomes a standard and the trees become a little bit taller and the giraffes that actually somehow mutated where their necks become a little longer, they can reach those trees, they survive, the ones with shorter neck dies off. And that's kind of how uh, the evolution came along where the trees become taller and giraffes with a long neck came along. And that is very similar to how these like technology have been evolving as well, where the need from us humans are really connected with these solutions that technology provides and with blockchain technology and you know like stuff like meta meta from facebook um it's coming in a time where us humans are starting to develop this uh sort of desire for an interesting new way of connecting with other humans through the internet like we started off with myspace or way way before like even uh, six degrees and stuff like that um and it's kind of a what's the word in biology like it's it's when it's when two things evolve together uh so we are now very used to communicating via the smartphone and a little rectangle that really connects us with the rest of the world but then uh i think what most people are starting to envision us as humans in the future is we're able to connect with anyone anywhere in a very hyper realistic way like put on a VR goggle and I can actually see you in person. And maybe instead of people listening to this podcast on a headphone on on, in an Uber or something, they can somehow put on a Google glass and be here with us on this, at this table and really like see us communicate. Um, So yeah, like, I think this is very interesting stuff that uh, we're going into. And um, yeah, anyway, let me ask you this question. Uh, What do you think about this? What do you think about the, Sometimes I reflect on the the potential ways this could have gone. When I say this, I mean, say, take the evolution from uh, chimpanzees or bonobos into like human beings, right? Like we have a particular form function with fingers and toes and size and cognitive abilities that's relatively consistent across our species. And that the, the fact that we've, we've, nature has just discovered this form function um, and that we've been able to do what we have been able to do seems like it's a product of our form function. Like just practically speaking, a giraffe couldn't make a rocket ship physically. They just couldn't operate, uh, like a, a computer. They, I can't think of any possible way that other life forms, other form functions on this planet could have built the technology that enables us to do what we do. And I think it's, part of this continual um, process of evolution is, is the technology itself. It's like the output of, you can't look at the butterfly as different from the caterpillar. Like it's the same thing, even though it's in a completely different form function, it's the continuality of that, um, 
endeavor really. And I think, okay, if that's true, is that, is this, could it have gone any other way? And if you think no, if you think, well, this form function is a requirement of our gravitational force, there's some parameters of like, well, this is the gravity on earth. This is the amount of sun exposure and variance in the climate, but maybe there's some variability in the form function we could have had. We could have been smaller or slightly bigger, but like ultimately you need to interact with physical things. Like these are limits of the universe and you, the technology of, of free flowing electrons and the ability to store those and gates, how we do, there doesn't seem to be other ways to do that. And so the technology and the pathway of form function to technology, to the internet, to collectively, um, integrating our ideas through communication pathways, uh, neural nets, basically. I'm like, could, is this is this a is this a very predictable path? Is this something that could is represented on other planets? And the more I think about this, the more I think yes. Uh, but I'm curious to hear your reaction if you push back on that at all, or if you see it differently. Um, and then I'm like, okay, well, it would make sense to me that if that's true there's some pathway of connecting our planet to other planets, just like human beings are building technology to connect to ourselves. I don't think it's by physically going out. I don't think it's by blasting off in rocket powered spaceships uh, to get there. I think there's gotta be some other way mm. to connect to the whole situation. Could it have been any other way? Now that is a very interesting uh, question that you're actually touching on on like quantum physics where evolution happens as you put it form function right like we randomly developed the opposable thumbs that made us a bit better than the other humanoids and that allowed us to propagate in our gene pool and that became the dominant primate right and that process that little improvement process happens across the entire history of life forms and one might argue, and I think a lot of physicists are actually saying this, um, if all the uh, sort of, because on, on a molecular level or even lower level, it's all just um, um, particles doing very predictable things with a measurable statistics, statistical outcome of, okay, there's this X percent chance that this particle is going to do this next, right? Then is there really a free will? Like, are we all just dictated by the physical form? Like our brain is nothing but a bunch of neural networks that operate a certain way. And we, even the, the, the concept of personality is just a massive set of uh, trial and error. Like you touch something really hot, you realize that that hurts you. So you learn to never do it again. And if I talk to a girl and I say to her like, Hey, you're fucking hot. And she comes at me at with a negative attitude. Then I realize, okay, you should be polite to a girl. Don't cat call anyone. So everything is just kind of a, almost like a predetermined set of reaction. Um, ever since the animal, uh, came along and there's this brain developed, right? Um, so, so yeah, anyway, I what think do you that's think a very of, interesting topic. What do you think of randomness? Do you think randomness, because this is one thing I learned recently is that when you calculate randomness and may, I, I'm not sure if this is the only way to do it, but when you calculate randomness on a computer using a computer program like Rand, uh, what's happening is that the program is referencing the position of the mouse on the screen and using that, those mm -hmm. coordinates to generate the uh, the end, the source of the, the output. So it's like, if, if your mouse is like one pixel over, it'll be a different output, but they assume that the, your mouse is randomly on the screen, but there's not like, um, there's not like a way to just develop a random number. It's kind of a hard problem. And yeah, I, I in, in natural science, uh, randomness is a very, uh, talked about topic, they call it entropy, where the uh, world tends to go into chaos. And if you, for example, if you have a dish where you put like 10 black balls and 10 white balls on the other side, eventually it's going to be evenly distributed. And it takes energy to put it back into order. And that's what life is. Life is putting particles into order, into very complex systems of organs and cells. And I think in computer science, it's a little bit different. Um, arguably it's almost impossible to create perfect randomness. And this is one of the things that, uh, actually at only one, um, 
try to do, we have a NFT launch pad and we want, we are using a lottery system where every participant that wants to buy this NFT, they would pay for a ticket. And then at the end of it, we would do some like a lucky draw to see who actually got it in a random and fair way. And we want to do that on chain. So we built a on chain, uh, lot, um, randomness function using Zig. Uh, initially we thought about using chain link. So, uh, for those that, uh, don't know a chain link actually do a lot more than oracles. They have a randomness verifiable on randomness function on chain, which allows uh, protocols to use a randomness function that is public and you can, uh, use it in a trustless way that you can, you know, that there's no, uh, tampering with the outcome. So, uh, according to my lead blockchain engineer, uh, he said like randomness is not, it's never perfect. And it really depends on how that system engineer implemented it. Uh, like I wish I can shine more light on like how the technicals are done, but I, I believe this is a ongoing, um, you know, um, endeavor by computer scientists as well. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like, uh, like one of these things, the deeper you think about it, the more confusing it is, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you think there's a relationship there between like a little bit, I, I found, I just can't get this out of my head. We were talking about pre-show the, uh, the way the brain is structured and hmm. that uh, the particular part of the brain of the, the pineal gland is being kind of, pretty center stru structure structurally in the middle of the brain. So that would tell you it's quite old. Um, and I think about this relationship between how humans are structured physically in our form and about how we're, what we're creating is structured in a similar pattern. I mean, the parallels between technology and software, uh, both metaphorically and then just speaking objectively about how like memory is stored is striking to me. And it, it it seems like the more we develop, the more we ought to reflect occasionally on the methods that we've developed. And Web3, you know, we throw it around like it's just a money-making scheme, but really it's a, it's a breakthrough in how the organizational structure of technology works for humans. And I, I wonder what the parallel is there. Like, is it a, do you see this as a, like on-chain, when something is on-chain, that's a, as objective as you can get objectively verifiable source of truth and it's decentralized in the way that like reputation would be decentralized in a tribe where everyone is storing this information like leon uh you know it has a reputation with everyone that that he knows and therefore it's de it's a decentralized source it's not like reputation is stored in a building and if i want to check if leon is a reputable guy I go into that building and it seems like we've been collectively throughout the last few hundred years, we've been centralizing the intelligence. We've been like, it's this, mm. the credit bureaus are a good example. Like if I want to lend Leon, uh, if I want to decide whether to give him a loan or not, a bank will refer to a centralized database to make that determination. They're not going to rely mm -hmm. on a decentralized method of people. So I'll pause there, but does that, do you see um, kind of this like, centralization decentralization is a part of like a, a part yeah. of something bigger yeah i guess um this is almost going into the realm of like spirituality and stuff like that but um for i think the the the, the core of this conversation is about consensus mm. right like for decentralization it's about establishing a consensus without the need of a cent uh, a, an authority essentially and one can argue animals have been doing that for a very long time. And especially you can look at hives, uh, hive minds like insects, right? Like they have a very structured society form where you have the soldiers, you have the workers, you have the, the queen and everything. And they have that consensus built into their body in order to perform for the better of the entire network of insects in a hive. Uh, for example, I learned this the other day watching a documentary about mushrooms. And one of the very interesting infection, fungal infection is where it, the fungus infects an, an ant and they wouldn't kill that ant. 
but they would want this ant to go into the hive and then infecting the entire colony. And that's how the mushroom gains, uh, you know, propagation. And what the ants developed over time through the evolution is that there's this, these guardian ants at their front door. If they see this ant with the fungal infection, they detect this with smell, they would carry that ant out, kill it, and then suicide. Yeah. Right. And that's, yeah. that's real hardcore. <laughs> that's real yeah. hardcore. And, and that's like a, basically they are able to function as part of that network without someone telling them what to do. So establishing consensus, right? And when people talk, when, especially when my friends that are not in the crypto space ask me, so what is this decentralization? What is this a consensus mechanism, proof of stake, proof of work? It sounds so complicated. Um, a very good analogy of that in the human context, uh, it would be, Say you and I and a few other friends, we want to go watch a movie, but we have different ideas of what movies to watch. And a very good analogy for the proof of work is if we have five of us, we're just going to say, hey, let's all do a Sudoku puzzle. Whoever wins first is going to decide or put up a vote on what movies to go watch first. And if I finish it first, I want to watch uh, Inception. And we go watch Inception. And proof of stake is like we five of us wants to watch a movie and we there's a piggy bank and we're just going to put money into that piggy bank and also vote for what movie to watch then the most amount of money contributing the vote towards the movie we're going to watch that movie um so yeah i think the mm. I, I guess the underlying analogy there is all about consensus and it feels like in that example you could even take that a step further where say you you have a group of people say 10 people and you're deciding what movie to watch presumably you're each at, you're each representing your vote your desire on what movie to watch for kind of a intuitive feeling as as to what would benefit your life the most maybe you've been sad recently and you really want to go see a comedy because that and so that would benefit your life the most maybe you're like you've been bored and you're feeling like an action movie would benefit your life the most and so there's this internal assessment of what what do i prefer and preference assuming preference is based on what's good for my my holistic character that's your that's that's the objective of your vote where I, I view that the the opposite end of the spectrum would be what do we need you know we're a tight-knit group maybe we've been fighting a lot so we need to go watch like a a, a romantic comedy and it, and and i think ants like the ant at the front door that detected the fungi he's thinking always like the when the, the hive mind is running the script that's like what can i do that's best for the colony always like they're not thinking mm -hmm. what's what's best for me. There's a complete loss of self identity, and this happens, you know, when you, we, I guess, human beings, we 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 sort of crave this. If you go to a rave, you know, or like a really heavy music concert, especially if you're on like MDMA or something else, and you and you go in, and it's like peak drop. The DJ comes in. You're or even a sporting arena, like somebody scored a goal. You're not. There's no self identity in that moment. You're completely lost in the experience of every everyone else that's there. And there's this emergent phenomenon of, uh, you know, led by either the DJ or the group or the the, the person who scored the goal. But it, it's that it's the kind of phase shift that we have the potential for that. It's um, it's super powerful. It's a really, really powerful thing. So I think you need a you need a mechanism. In the case of like our physical world, a rave is the mechanism, the arena, the security, the music. But in Web three, the mechanism might be the rails that we're laying today. So it's like I'm not sure what that looks like, but that that could feel like the 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 way that we all yeah. integrate ourselves. That's interesting. That's a very interesting angle. When the human brain is on MDMA, we have a lot of um, uh, synaptic serotonin level, which gives us a very high level of empathy and sympathy, which makes us almost more connected with other humans. And we would do things that want to make other humans feel better, right? And you would be nicer to people and all that stuff. And that's kind of almost like the ant analogy where you're kind of, uh, sacrificing yourself for the good of the the group uh, and this is actually one of the problems for DAOs 
Never in my mm-hmm. life I thought MDMA and DAO would make a connection mm-hmm. there. But um, so when people talk about decentralized autonomous organizations, um, the concept is cool, right? Like you have a group of people and they all participate in the governance of the underlying platform, making up the rules and the development and the roadmap and the utilization of the funds and all that stuff. But what's different about the participants in the DAO to the ant or the person on MDMA is that the people in these DAOs, they are motivated for self-interest, not the group, right? And I, I say that, I, I say that um, uh, with, with some, you know, take it with a grain of salt, not everyone's that, doing that, right? But usually what these people are actually doing is that they're staking tokens so that they can earn more tokens and they want this project to go up so that his own financial portfolio goes up. And that motivation is very different than you know, saying, I want to participate in governing this place to make this a better product. And sometimes those two things are not aligned. Mm. You could see that like in a country, like um, oftentimes, I'd say the majority of the time, the the incentive of the individual is aligned with the incentive of the group. Like as a, you know, as a farmer, I want to make food and I want to be able to sell that food for money and other people want that food. So that's, we're aligned. Like the group wants food. I want to make food and I want to sell food. And so it would make, that makes sense. Then there's, I think the large scale externalities, that's where the tragedy of the commons happens. So it's like, well, should, and that's where, that's effectively what regulation is. And if you think about regulation in the web two world and governance, it's, we have, uh, mechanisms for preventing negative externalities. So what do I mean by that? Like if I'm a, a forestry company, if I'm harvesting the forest and turning the forest into logs for lumber, well, I- I'm allowed to do that. But if I were to just do that at my maximum capability, then we would all be dead because we would harvest all the forest. And we're kind of in that situation today. I'd argue the biggest threats to humankind on earth today is deforestation and the lack of biodiversity and the negative health, the negative outcomes from that. And so it's almost necessary at this point to enact a, a a high, a, a, a phase, a consciousness shift to say, okay, you know, you can't just destroy as much forest for your own individual profitability. You have to now think what's good for us as a group. Otherwise we'll all be dead. And that's when it's like, okay, what, what best, what's best for me is what's best for the group. Um, but this is like, the, this is the concept of like freeloaders and corruption mm-hmm. because you can benefit mm-hmm. more as an individual if you steal from the group than you would if you were to be honest. But if everyone's honest, then we benefit the most. Uh, it's like game theory, which is mm-hmm. super interesting. So my, my family uh, originated from Beijing and uh, my ancestry is from Mongolia. So we our family has encountered a lot of I guess, uh, ex- experiences with the, the communist party. And back in when my, when my dad is young, uh, they would basically do everything the state tells them to do. And that is a form of government where we, as a, a community, as like the citizens of the country would trust that the higher ups knows the best and they would make the best decision for the entire country. And we just do as they say, that would be best for the people, right? And so that's, that's basically uh, a communism. And on the other hand, we have like the, the current democratic system where we elect local governors or like the people can actually vote for the president. Um, or in Hong Kong, we have something in between where we vote for like a regional uh, representative and they would vote on behalf of the region, right? So I think the, the, the uh, debate here is which mechanic would result in the actual best interest for the people involved. Like, like your, for your example there, um, it's kind of almost undeniable is that objective truth that we are looking, we are facing problems with biodiversity and deforestation and global warming. And those problems are real. Even like Le- uh, Leonardo DiCaprio came on the uh, UN and talked about mm-hmm. that. Uh, it's a consensus, but still uh, we are Pop, we're probably not doing the best job right now. Like, so the question then becomes, why aren't we doing the best job to solve these problems? And that's because of the bad actors in the chain of command, where some of them are incentivized to work with these, you know, lumberers, or some of these have financial interests in, I don't know, cre- uh, overfishing so that they can sell more seafood or something like that. So 
So yeah, I think that's a. Mm. I'm I'm no I'm no I'm not a big guy on politics, so I'm not too sure what the well, yeah. best outcome. Well, is. I kind of think I, I kind of think in your position, it benefits you to have to think about these things because the the intersectionality of governance on chain and governance in the real world are the same thing. I mean, they were, were they're different technologies, but effectively they have the same underlying psychological mechanics. So I think of part of the reason for for that for what you're saying, which is why aren't we as a society globally calibrated properly to the challenges at hand with respect to the the earth and bio, lack of biodiversity. My thought is we went through less than 100 years ago a major major like unbelievably horrific experience uh, with the Holocaust, with uh, you know, Mao's China, with the effective extinguishing of millions of people, and the the consensus around that is so clear. Like that is that was such a terrible event, and it was almost we're still in like the post traumatic ripple effect of that of that event. There's still movies that coming out and have been. <coughs> And I think there's a lot of people, especially in the West, that are and just that carry the Western mentality of individualism, that are very, very scared of a pooling power centrally. Because the downside, the I mean, as you can see in China, like the powerful aspect, the upside is you can make hospitals in three days, right? You can do incredible things when you have a, a, a quick decision maker, and shit takes way longer if you don't. So in, mm -hmm. the upsides are huge. The downsides are also huge when you make bad decisions. And so I think people mm -hmm. are rightfully scared of saying, okay, we agree on this as a major challenge, right? Like we shouldn't be cutting down rainforests. Um, but how do we enforce that? Do we give all the power to you know, the government? And then how do we take it away once that's successful? And um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the tension is how do you how do you effectively how do you allocate power in a dynamic way so mm. that it changes and it doesn't just stay with uh, stay at the level of abstraction that it's at? Yeah, I mean, I don't have the answer to that. I think that's a very complex politics question. But mm. if you just look at the recent you know, COVID situation, how fast it was for China to just shut the border, right? Like one word from the upper uh, government and you can't leave the city. Yeah. Right. And everyone's staying in. No one's on the streets. It's like a dead city. But then some in other countries where, you know, people are having more say in what to do, uh, people are complaining that they're, they're protesting about, oh, I want to leave the country. I, I don't like this uh, mask requirement situation and uh, the government's stupid and stuff like that. Uh, and that changes, you know, people's decision on who's the next governor to vote for or whatever. So... Yeah, I don't know. How, do you, how have you thought about the uh, governance structure for the DAO on only one? Have you taken playbooks from other projects or have you mm -hmm. built it in a specific way for your application? Um, so we have, we're using this uh, a protocol called Squad. And Squad is a platform that allows uh, users to log in with a wallet and they would detect what tokens or NFTs you have in the wallet and that would measure sort of your um, weighting in the voting inside a DAO. And for us, we've created an NFT collection called the Once and we have this DAO in place. Uh, however, it's not that easy to achieve the quorum and consensus needed within the DAO uh, for the simple reason of like, again, like people want to vote for whatever's best for their personal interest, meaning I want a 10 X, right? That's basically what they want. Um, but in terms of the project, sometimes it's about longevity. Sometimes it's about, okay, we need to, uh, preserve our company treasury in a certain way we need to be iterating the product we need to have a lean startup mentality we need to be um partnering with this and that or investing long term with you know stuff like it's almost like delayed gratification instead mm -hmm. of a short-term pump thing and sometimes these uh members are raising very interesting proposals that's actually uh something that's very feasible and something that we want to implement but then there's not enough people voting for it because they rather vote for uh please buy back all uh, half of the supply right then it's, it's it's like okay everyone's gonna vote for that but is that really 
good for the project long term. So um, I think right now what, where we're at as, as a company, we're in this mixed format. We have uh, a specific group chat with the people that are really into the project. They have obviously holdings of our NFT and tokens. We take a lot of advice and we share with them a lot of our development process internally, even if it's like a sketchy idea and really get their feedback on this. So we're trying to really take into account their um, ideas and opinions. So I would say that's almost like half a DAO. Mm. Uh, and besides layer one protocols where these people establish consensus through POS, I actually don't think I know a DAO that's fully functional where the uh, DAO members are actually dictating every step of the way for the company. And that I would imagine you'd agree that that's probably a good thing in that if you had a complete democracy uh, on the DAO where everyone votes according to how much how much they have ownership in the in token and there's no centralized you know president so to speak um, that the system is vulnerable to the whims of all the individuals acting on the best interest. similar to the you know it's uh, same same idea here it's like okay if everyone's acting on their own best interest then the project might head straight into a wall um, <laughs> and then it's yeah. destroyed and everyone loses. Do you see DAO governance structures kind of eventually coming to a, um, not consensus, but a common way of structuring where they have elected leaders? Uh, a few different projects I've interviewed uh, are going down this pathway where they have mm. the individuals that own the token can vote on different people and those people have certain privileges uh, and then there's term limits so they can, you know, be in there and they have to get re-voted in, in again. And it seems, I mean, it's effectively how the U S and democracy is run with representative government, which seems to be a good balance because you have every individual, there's so many decisions to be made in a, in a project and every individual is not suited or interested in making all these decisions. So to have a representative person who's just paid a salary to make these decisions makes a lot of sense. It seems like a good balance. Um, yeah. Um, it's also about the amount of knowledge the decision maker has, mm -hmm. right? It's like, why would you ask a 10 year old to vote for a president? That's why you have to be, you know, like a certain mm -hmm. qualification to get the uh, voting right. So I think that's, I think what you described there could be a very feasible way for the future of DAOs where you elect people that you know, have a certain amount of uh, experience and knowledge in decision making, and then you would propose different proposals, and then the people that are voting can vote for those proposals, but not the entire control of the company. Mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because you're you're kind of balancing two things. You're balancing. Uh, you don't want power to be so centralized that there's no feedback mechanism for the individuals that are being governed to overthrow that that leader, you know, if they voted to say 60% vote and they wanted to get rid of them, if they can't do that, you know, if 99% of people agree that this president or leader should be out of, even it's just a Dow project and that can't happen, then the, the, the project's off the rails. And the same thing on the other side, if there's no leadership, then there's no direction, then there's kind of chaos on an individual level. Um, Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. It's funny how we're actually almost like going in circles where people are really boasting this idea of decentralization, but then we're slowly crawling our way back into the systems that we are all very familiar with. And we're almost like talking about a board seat, right? Yeah. It's like uh, IPO company has board seats with everyone has a voting right as a quorum and uh, even a CEO or a founder can be fired like Steve Jobs. Right. So um, it's interesting to see that we're actually going towards a direction backwards uh, in a very healthy way. So sometimes uh, I, I, I started to use this word web 2.5. <laughs> um, I know there, I know there's all this like web I like something that. thrown around like web seven, web five, whatever. But uh, the, the, the idea here is we're halfway between web two and web three, not just on the uh, governance level, but also on the technology level. Like, would you say OpenSea is a web free project? Uh, not necessarily considering that they do have a 
you know, shareholder structure and they have been using, I would say maybe 80% of their source code is probably using Web2 technology. They're using a centralized database. They're probably powering it with uh, like Amazon Web Service or something. Um, and having a product that's completely developed on Web3 technology, like say there is a decentralized cloud, there's a decentralized domain, and then there's a decentralized web browser. I think what's going to end up happening is that it's going to be a very slow and hard user experience, mm -hmm. right? So on a tech level and the governance level, we're kind of between web two and web three right now. Yeah. You know, there's this, uh, this, this Pareto distribution that has been, Jordan Peterson's a public speaker and he talks about this and has elucidated it in a way that I've hadn't heard it articulated before, which he said, uh, you know, if you look at the, the political agitation among the consolidation of wealth, the, the 0.1% of people owning, you know, some large percentage of wealth in society. And this is typically talked about in respect to the American context. There's a, a lot of anger around that and people sort of don't know how, why that is the way it is. And uh, they feel maybe angry at the fact that it is and say there shouldn't be any billionaires at all. And he makes this point, Jordan Peterson, that this is not a phenomenon of currency. It's certainly not a phenomenon of capitalism. This is a phenomenon of the universe. When you have a, a linear distribution of resources, eventually those resources consolidate into ever smaller and smaller increments. This is like true of stars in the universe. Like everything's blasted out, planets consolidate together, and 99% of all mass in the universe is consolidated in just 1% of the, the solar systems. Um, and you can play that out into so many different scenarios. And it's mm. like, I see the same thing happening in crypto. It's like, there's going to just be a consolidation of when you look at servers, like cloud-based servers, there's a reason why the top five companies in the NASDAQ are effectively half of the returns. It's like, there's consolidation of resources. The smart people want to work with smart people. The high returns go to the high people who make the most. And I, and I see that being true here, where it's like every time we want to have linear distribution of, say, servers um, in, in cloud for decentralization, to your point, it's just going to, there's going to be a price you pay, which is going to be, it's, it's a worse performing option than if you were to go with a consolidated version, which is like, it's this, mm -hmm. we're never going to hit this stable state. I think that's the, the thesis. Mm -hmm. It's like, there's never gonna, we're never going to look and say, well, we figured it out. That's the way we govern ourselves or that's the way we run servers. You always learn and improve, mm -hmm. but there's I always more to do. Hmm. I, I guess throughout history, humans have tried different types of ways to sort of elect the elites. And right now we're in a capitalistic open fair market types of system where we reward those with merits, right? Um, like, although one can argue meritocracy is a, it, it's a false dream because, you know, there's many things that uh, are by chance and totally random. Like if you're born into a wealthier family, you get to a better school, you're better educated, you're better off starting a startup. And some people might have to, you know, as soon as they graduate, they got to get a job to support their family. Mm -hmm then in a way it is unfair that the top 1% is holding most of the wealth. But at the same time, capitalism also brings us a uh, very good uh, products because it encourages competition, even in the context of content creators, like, you know, uh, Joe Rogan obviously is one of the best, uh, the goat in like podcasts. And that's because he's, you know, competing with many other people that are doing the same thing. And he's providing value in ways that he find really interesting. And um, I think the same goes with blockchain and layer ones and stuff like that. Like we chose Solana because at the time uh, last year when we started, we looked into all these layer ones and we thought Solana has the most promising technology, right? Like with blockchain, it's always about the trilemma. Um, I don't want to go too far into like uh, this direction, but I think it's all about competition and the reward for the winner is currently how this society is constructed. Mm. So what's, uh, where are you guys now? You've raised what? 3 million. Is that right? On the project and have roughly 20 people working on it. Is that, that's, uh, that's quite accurate. Yeah. I, I don't know if that was a guess or if I've told you this before. Oh, no. No, um, just but we, I see. I see. So we've, uh, we've raised $3 million, uh, around starting from June to August last year, uh, led by Animoca, uh, brands and Alameda research and Solana, uh, 
uh, foundation. Then we've launched a product uh, in beta. So our, that was September, end of September last year. Time really flies and few months feels like a decade in crypto. Uh, so now we're about to go public launch. The platform's almost ready. Uh, we're going to launch uh, around the end of June. So I guess by this podcast ca- come out, is almost that time. And I think we have a long road ahead. Um, Web free social is going to be a space that's going to really drive web free adoption, in my opinion. And the timing, in my personal opinion, is impeccable because of this whole NFT boom. A lot of my friends, for example, that never touched crypto got into crypto. They learned about Phantom Wallet or MetaMask because of NFTs, and they because of NFTs, which is a lot more fun to the no coiners than say DeFi and yield farming and stuff like that. Uh, the active user base of crypto has really grown this year, and we all, we're also seeing a lot of institutional adoption. So I feel like we're leaving a stage of sort of. Uh, web free sort of this anarchists and uh this small group of people into like the broader markets and the real adoption of web free technology i think is really going to start um if we go all the way back again to 2017 i would say 95 percent or more users are just there to trade and flip tokens Mm -hmm. Right. But nowadays, I would say maybe 80 percent is doing that. But the other 20 percent are actually using this because it is providing a viable solution to problems they actually have in real life. Mm. Uh, And I think this number is just going to go up and uh, people are going to slowly utilize blockchain technology in different things like, I don't know, even like insurance, medical tech, um, of, of course, finance, but also things like social. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And it's a really exciting time. Who are the people you are trying to attract to the project for users or consumers? People like you. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> um, content, content creators. I'm, I'm going to send you a sign-up link later for yeah, early access, it. and uh, you should totally try out the platform. Um, so we're really trying to create a platform. So social media has two main problems right now. I would say one of them is the sort of authoritarian control and, uh, you know, we as users of Instagram, for example, we don't control our data. We don't know what they do with it. I don't know how they monetize us. And that is a problem that's really good to put on headlines, but it's also not a problem intense enough for a lot of people to switch platforms. However, the other problem is for creators to be able to monetize their activities and their content. That is the real problem and more intense and more frequent happening across content creators. And that's the one we're trying to solve first. So we've created a platform that allows creators to, number one, be able to mint their NFT collection very easily. And you can gate your social media content behind that NFT. So you can create an NFT, which we call member pass for your fans. And those that hold it can see some of the exclusive content that you post. And on top of that, we have a uh, something we call a creator staking pool, which allows uh, every creator to have their own staking pool. And uh, the APY on those pools depends on how active you are as a creator on the platform. So more people will be staking tokens in your pool if you're active and you earn more as the uh, activity goes up. So that's the experiment Mm. that we're doing right now. And uh, I would love to see how that goes. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Godspeed. Keep keep crushing it. Keep doing your thing. That sounds like such an awesome idea. Uh, Thanks so much, Leon. This has been uh, such a pleasure. So much fun to hop on with you and and cover such wide-ranging topics. Really enjoyed it. Likewise. A really fun interview. Um, hope my, my eye bag's not distracting people too much. I've been lacking sleep these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you and everyone else. All right, man. Talk soon. Talk soon. Sweet.